Millennials, Gen Z, and baby boomers are dying. At least the categorization is. And in his new book, my guest today explains why that's a good thing. My guest today is Mauro F. Guillen. He is a professor of management and the vice dean for the MBA for Executives program at Wharton. And in his new book out today, The Perennials, The Megatrends Creating a Post-Generational Society, he talks about why we need to get rid of classifications of generations. So for example, millennial, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, baby boomers, the greatest generation, all of the generations. And he makes a pretty good argument for why it's actually holding us back from being able to accomplish more in our day-to-day -day lives. So I don't wanna to delay too much more. This was a fantastic conversation, but before I jump into it, I do wanna let you know that I'm hiring. I am looking for a video editor. This is a part-time position. You need to have some experience in Premiere Pro, but really there is an enormous amount of training attached, so you don't have to be that great yet. This is an awesome position if you're a student, you're starting college, you're in college, you just recently graduated, or you're just looking for a side hustle. So if that sounds like you or someone you know, head over to tlbc.co slash apply and fill out the quick application. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And without further ado, here's my conversation with Mauro F. Guillen. Your new book is called The Perennials, The Megatrends Creating a Post-Generational Society. Uh, something I was really interested in, like, I, I really want to dig into this concept of like a post-generational society. Could you start out by just like breaking down for us what exactly you mean by that and why it's kind of important to label it? Yeah, absolutely. So as, um, as you know, for the longest time here in the United States in particular, we have been categorizing people into generations. Uh, this has become uh, like an obsession, I think, here in the United States. And uh, every 10 years or 15 years, we come up with a new term and we come up with a new set of uh, stereotypes as to how people in that new age cohort are supposed to be behaving and what their values are and so on and so forth. And uh, it is something that is uh, peculiarly American. And uh, I think uh, there are many, many problems with that. Uh, the first problem, of course, is that the boundaries between one generation and the next uh, are completely arbitrary. The second one is that there's so much variation within a generation. I mean, people are not all the same. You know, you talk to millennials and they rebel against that label because that doesn't um, allow them to express their individuality. And uh, in any event, now that we have real time digital data from everybody, right? I mean, we can actually study individuals. We don't have to put people in these broad categories called generations. Uh, they're very misleading. I think they're very stereotypical and uh, they, they tend to essentially speak to um, you know, uh, aspects that are not necessarily true, uh, that don't characterize the entire group of people. So the post-generational society is when we overcome that and uh, we essentially have a situation in which people are perennials. They don't think or act their age necessarily. So age is no longer like a constraint that prevents us from doing certain things that we would like to do. I guess where I'm getting stuck is like, why were we doing that in the first place? Why, what was the benefit of, of breaking people up into these sort of generational groups? Yes, that's a, uh, that's a great question. And uh, the answer I think is relatively straightforward. It was very convenient. It was very convenient for the government. It was very convenient for large organizations, for employers, for companies. It was very convenient for schools and for universities. So people essentially were told you have to make progress in life. First, uh, you're supposed to play when you're very little, then you study, then you work, then you retire. Uh, it was easy then to run the world in that way. And especially, as I said, governments and companies really like that because it was easy then to put people in little categories and just to treat them according to their age or to their age group. Uh, and then, you know, the other side of this is marketing. Uh, so um, the concept of generation was embraced, especially here in the United States, by marketers and by advertisers a long time ago uh, in the 1950s when they started to compare, for example, the great generations who lived through the Great Depression and World War II with the baby boomer generation. And then it became like a habit to start labeling generations because it was convenient. At the time, marketers and advertisers didn't have real-time data on people like we do today through all of the social media platforms. And so they had to categorize people in some way. They categorized people in terms of whether they lived in the city or in a small town, whether they were men or women. Uh, and the other category was uh, whether they belonged to a certain uh, generation or not. What I'm hearing is prior to the kind of like big data environment that we live in, where you can very directly like dive into the individual and, and learn an enormous amount about any individual person uh, providing their consent and so on and so forth. Um, prior to that, there was really no way to like 
get that kind of information and store it and analyze it in a, in a major way. And so we were maybe like putting people into these groups for, for those purposes. And, th and that was useful, but it's kind of losing its value now. What then would you say is the value going forward of this kind of like perennial post-generational society? Like what does that unlock for us that that we can't currently do? Well, uh, I think the post-generational society and uh, essentially treating everybody as perennials opens up opportunities for everybody. Think about, you know, people who are in their 40s or 50s and they would like to go back to school or they would like to go back and learn online. Uh, well, now there are opportunities for them, but uh, 20 or 30 years ago, those opportunities were very, very scarce. I uh, think about the people who, uh, you know, are approaching retirement age, but they really would prefer to continue working because otherwise they feel they might be disconnected from their social life. Uh, well, we're going to have more opportunities for that, uh, both uh, physically and online. Uh, think about also the, all of the people who essentially um, miss some kind of a train in life. For example, teen mothers, only 2% of them graduate from college. Well, we should give them more opportunities to maybe attend college at a later age. Uh, think about uh, also high school dropouts. Uh, think about people who uh, abuse uh, drugs or substances uh, and they recover from that. Well, they've missed on some of these uh, life transitions. So they haven't been able maybe to finish a degree. So we should be providing those people, especially those people who, for one reason or another, have missed some kind of a transition in life. We should be providing them with new opportunities. And that's what I think the post-generational society and this society of perennials actually offers. It offers an opportunity for everybody. It levels the playing field. Mm -hmm. So then is the the core of sort of the argument against this kind of um, generational labeling that we then focus, for example, uh, thinking of the the person who missed out on four years of college during that like age group that you theoretically should be doing that. Um, is it that the marketing, the opportunities, the funding, so on and so forth, all of that focuses on this label, this specific like age range that should be going through that at this time. And so those things aren't necessarily reaching the people who missed it for any number of reasons um, and might be go trying to go back later in life. Is, is that sort of the argument here? Uh, that is a, a very important part of the argument. In other words, uh, to um, stop compartmentalizing our lives uh, so strictly as a straitjacket, right? That we need to do certain things at certain points in time. And once again, those people who fall behind then find it very difficult to recover. That's one aspect of it. But the other aspect is think about women, for example. Uh, you know, this um, very orderly, uh, you know, transition from one stage in life to the next uh, was really thought for men, right, uh, back in the 1940s and 50s, uh, because it worked really well for men, right? The women were staying at home. Uh, they didn't have that many uh, labor market opportunities. Now, the situation today is completely different. And of course, women face all of those constraints because they want to have babies, but uh, they also want to advance with their career. So we need to introduce so much more flexibility to the system. Uh, so that uh, it's not just uh, people who have uh, missed uh, one of those transitions in life, but it's also all women are facing these constraints. And, uh, and, and, and as I said earlier, uh, there's also the, uh, the fact that uh, people's preferences for what they want to do at different points in time uh, are also shifting. So uh, we need to introduce more flexibility. We need to give people more opportunities to do what they really want to do at, uh, at uh, whatever age they happen to find themselves. This idea of like focusing on the individual and being able to cater to an individual's needs and, and the life that they're specifically living, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think the part I'm struggling with is how do we actually, like what needs to happen, I assume culturally, societally, like, this is a very large top-down change that, that would need to occur. So how do we get there? And it's not gonna be easy, right? Because we have been living our lives in this way for too long, for more than a hundred years. So what needs to happen is first and foremost, as you just mentioned, there needs to be a change uh, in mindset, in the culture, right? Uh, but how can we accelerate that change? Well, we can accelerate that change if governments and employers and companies do their part, which is to introduce more flexibility, to stop discriminating by age. Uh, you see very few companies these days, uh, you know, want to invest in the uh, training or education of a 50 year old worker because they feel, oh, I'd much rather you know, hire a 20 year old. But you know, the problem is that there's fewer 20 year olds. Uh, and so sooner or later, they're gonna have to rely on the 50 year olds because of the decline in fertility. We just have uh, fewer younger young people. Um, so we need, uh, especially those two big actors, government and uh, employers, especially big employers to change their tune, to change their approach to how they deal with workers, with employees. 
And I think that will go a long way in terms of changing uh, the context and changing the mindset. I want to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, NordVPN. Here's how it works. Imagine you're driving a car. If you leave your house and you go straight to work, anyone can see where you came from, what route you took, and who you are. That's what happens anytime you go to a website online. But with a VPN, all of that information is protected. So you get all the benefit of being online and browsing the internet without being watched. And NordVPN is the fastest VPN out there with over 5,600 servers across 60 different countries. I actually did a speed test with my NordVPN account, and I have just about the same speed as I do without being connected with significantly more protection. And speaking of protection, I love NordVPN's dark web monitor feature. They scan the dark web to make sure that any like sensitive information like your passwords, your credit card information aren't compromised. And if they are, you get to find out early and that can make a huge difference in protecting yourself. So yeah, I feel a lot safer online with NordVPN and I think you will too. Grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash TLBC. You'll get a massive discount off of a NordVPN plan as well as a free bonus gift. And it's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Head over to nordvpn.com slash TLBC or click the link in the description of this episode to learn more. So the, the message to, because I'm I'm thinking of my like individual listener, let's say Sarah Johnson. I don't know if that's a real person listening, but hopefully it is. And I just freaked you out by saying your name. Um, how does their life change over the next five to 10 years? Well, I think uh, Sarah uh, stands to benefit uh, from a potential transition towards uh, what I call the post-generational society. I think Sarah also stands to uh, benefit if uh, for some reason uh, she uh, always wanted to do something but didn't ha find the moment or didn't have uh, the money to do it. Uh, so uh, this is a call for essentially creating a new way of living our lives uh, that essentially allows us to unleash our potential in ways that uh, was, uh, were very difficult in the past. So I think uh, Sarah uh, would probably benefit quite a bit uh, from this potential transition. And how do you think this... Um, uh dovetails or connects back to because I, I hear a really phenomenal opportunity to look at our lives with less regard for what like traditional stage we're in. And that to me feels like such an incredible place that we absolutely should go because there's no reason that somebody in their 50s shouldn't go back to school or shouldn't start a business or shouldn't whatever their goals were that they just couldn't do in their 20s. Um, but then when I, I, I take a step back and I look realistically at the uh, world that we live in, or at least in the US, like there are still very tangible barriers that make that harder. For example, um, the need for improvements in childcare or the need for improvements in healthcare or whatever it is. Like, how does this conversation connect back to, to those conversations in your mind? Yes, well, there are. Let's, let's uh, use the example uh, of uh, childcare because I think uh, it is a really important one given that we are struggling as a society to have enough young people. Uh, but we make it very hard for young couples to have uh, children, uh, especially when both of them want to pursue a professional career. Uh, and, you know, what we need is to think about very carefully, what is it that people want? Uh, so some people prefer, for example, to be given vouchers so that they can use them at the childcare center, which is right around the corner from where they live. Other people would prefer to have childcare uh, at their place of work uh, and so on. So, so there are uh, different options out there. And uh, there is some research on, on all of this. But once again, what uh, childcare or opportunities for uh, offering more childcare to more people essentially uh, introduce more degrees of flexibility so that both uh, the, the, the father and the mother can, uh, you know, or the parents can, um, you know, do the other things that they want to do in life and at the same time also uh, bring up uh, children. Uh, so once again, this uh, goes, I think, under the category of. Uh, uh, initiatives that may increase the flexibility in terms of how we live our lives. So let's talk about uh, uh, staying on that sort of topic. Let's let's talk about lateral thinking a bit, and and specifically uh, this approach of utilizing megatrends to analyze where we think uh, society is going. Um, because your first book also looked at things from 
this kind of approach of here's a number of different trends that feel maybe disconnected, but when you actually look at it, there are deep connections between them and they are all affecting each other. They're all playing off of each other. Uh, could you walk us through, uh, just to sort of establish the, the scene here, could you walk us through the process of analyzing these megatrends and like what that actually looks like on your end? Yeah, no, absolutely. So in my in my previous book, uh, 2030, I analyzed a, a broad range of uh, uh, economic, political, and technological trends. In the perennials, uh, the book that is coming out in August, I focus on essentially three trends that are, I think, uh, you know, creating uh, this post-generational society. Uh, so the first of those trends has to do with the fact that we're living longer now, but more importantly, that we stay healthy for a longer period of time, meaning we stay in good mental and physical shape for a longer period of time. And that essentially means that somebody who is 60, 65, 70, 75 can today pursue the lifestyle of uh, a 40 year old 20 years ago. Right. And that completely changes the game. Right. Because it essentially means that uh, we have uh, uh, you know, more time in our lives to do things. We, we can work, we can learn, we can have fun and so on and so forth. Uh, the second really, really important trend is technological change. So technological change always has negative effects, but also positive effects. The negative effect in this case is that, as you know, uh, many of us may be made redundant by new technologies. I'm not talking just about robotics, but also artificial intelligence. And so uh, if that, that wave of technological change catches you when you are in your 50s, it may be difficult for you to recover from that. Um, but the idea is that also uh, we find solutions in technology. So technology may also have a positive effect because now we see that online forms of working, online forms of learning are essentially helping people in those demographics uh, get back uh, on their feet and be relevant in this uh, ever-changing global economy. So we see that this second trend, technology can be positive or can be negative. Uh, but in any event, it's something that we need to understand as individuals and we need to uh, use it as a tool. Between technical, technological, technological changes uh, that are, are just shifting sort of the landscape of what work means and, and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we're living significantly longer and mo more of those years are actually more active than it was previously. What I'm seeing here, and correct me if this is wrong, but there is a macro conversation of like, we need to have this like post-generational society and that's gonna create all of these downstream effects for individuals. Uh, but on a micro level of me getting up and going to work tomorrow, connect those two for me. Uh, so lateral thinking is all about connecting the dots. It's like uh, looking at uh, things that appear to be completely separate, uh, uh, but then uh, in fact, uh, when they come together, they actually either create an opportunity or they generate a threat and we need to respond to that. Uh, so uh, we were talking just a moment ago about the three interrelated trends, life expectancy, the health span, and lastly, technological change. So you have to exercise your lateral thinking to see how the confluence, the convergence of those three trends affect you as an individual. Now, we're all different and we are positioned in different ways. And uh, obviously, these trends are catching us at different uh, points in our lives, at different ages. So we need to then come up with a recipe that is uh, more individualized as to how we need to change. Uh, what I always tell people is that what you need to do when confronted with all of these transformations and uh, you're trying to figure out exactly how they may be affecting you, you have to follow two golden rules, right? So the first golden rule is that you have to accept that the only possible response to change is change itself. That is to say that if you stand still while the environment is changing so quickly, you're not going to be ready for the future, right? The second principle is that especially when there's so much uncertainty as to where all of these different bits and pieces are gonna fall. What you need to do is to make decisions that are not irreversible. Let me explain. If you make today a decision that is very hard or very costly for you to reverse, uh, well, that's a recipe for disaster because uh, you cannot fully anticipate change. You cannot make a decision today that is irreversible and hope that it will be the ideal solution, the ideal decision for the next five years or 10 years. So you have to preserve an element of flexibility in your own decision making. This is also really important. That's, that's, that's the second, uh, you know, golden rule that I always tell people about. So then how does, and, and, and I apologize because I know we were just talking about the individual, but it did raise a question in my mind. Is that second golden rule still the case in making decisions within structures that are inherently difficult to reverse? For example, uh, uh, legal decisions are theoretically possible to reverse, but very challenging, especially if an actual law is passed. Um, so 
how do we, when we're looking at the societal and cultural changes that need to be made here, how do we maintain that sort of connection to making reversible decisions so that we can be flexible for the future without it being, without the answer being essentially what happens now, which is let's debate it forever and just sort of end up in gridlock and never make any decision. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's an interesting point. Now you're focusing on the macro level, you're focusing on the society. <laughs> And uh, yeah, absolutely. If the Supreme Court makes a decision uh, that ties us up for you know the next uh, 30 or 40 years, if the government passes a law, it may be very difficult to reverse in the near in the near term. Uh, I was more arguing at the individual level. What is it right, that individuals yeah. should do? But at the macro level, I think what's really important for our politicians, for our lawmakers, for people who have influence on things, is to also try to um, you know legislate or to try to introduce structural changes. Um, that's the term that you were using, in such a way that we can preserve the individuality, that we're not uh, like imposing on everybody the same pattern, right? I think it's really important to preserve that flexibility at that macro level as well. So create flexibility at the macro level by thinking about the individual and their mm -hmm. ability to create flexibility at the, the micro level. That's right. Okay, That's that, exactly makes, right. that makes a lot of sense to me. Let's zoom out a bit from this specific book, one thing I wanted to ask you about when we're looking at an analyzing megatrends and um, uh, lateral thinking as a way to identify and potentially address problems, especially very large problems. Uh, you mentioned in an interview in 2021, I assume it was part of the tour for 2030, um, you mentioned climate change as one of the like individual trends that obviously get a lot of focus for a lot of reasons, but that there were larger trends or interconnected trends rather that you also need to look at, which I, I completely agree with because ultimately you can't fully understand what's causing a problem unless you understand the interconnected pieces of that problem. What are your thoughts though on that approach giving sort of leeway to more nefarious actors to essentially delay making any decision because they kind of always have the response of, well, it's more complicated than that, um, especially in the case of something like climate change that is very complicated, but the solution has largely been agreed on for decades. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, the example of uh, climate, the climate emergency is a very good one. And you see Europe and uh, to a certain extent, the United States, we have been reducing our carbon emissions over the last 20 or 30 years. But the problem continues to grow in the world because we have the so-called emerging markets. Uh, so the emerging markets are polluting more now. And of course, when you, uh, so I'm talking about China, I'm talking about India. Uh, uh, when you ask them, why are you doing that? They say, well, you had a hundred years when you were polluting and you were able then to increase the standards of living. You are having a great life. Uh, do you want to deny us now uh, the opportunity to raise people out of poverty into the middle class, right? I think this is the biggest threat to climate change right now, but it's a, an argument by these emerging economies that is very difficult to rebut, right? Because how can you tell them, well, you know what? I mean, we enjoyed a hundred years of polluting the world and uh, uh, emitting carbon, but now you cannot do it, right? So uh, what we need to do, of course, is, uh, you know, come to the table, try to see and, and, and talk and see what are the the ways in which we can, um, uh, you know, make progress. Now, uh, you know, the other important thing here is that of all countries in the world, uh, precisely China and India and Southeast Asia, uh, they're going to be the most affected by climate change because of the geography, because uh, they have a lot of cities that are very close to the water and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I think they would be shooting themselves in the foot if they don't take action now, even though their priority is to continue lifting people out of poverty. But again, this, this creates a conundrum. This is like a very difficult situation, right? Because uh, we, the rich people in the world, we're telling the poor people, hey, you cannot enjoy the fruits of development, right? Because now we have this big problem. So that's where you see, as you were um, pointing out earlier, that's where you see these um, situations in which, unless you consider all of the relevant factors, you're not going to be able to address the problem. Mm -hmm. So then what do you say to the like, okay, we're looking at this on a, a global level, we have these emerging economies that are trying to develop and, and are following what is essentially a tried and true path that, that we follow to do so. 
Uh, and that that's a really important conversation to have. Uh, but then I imagine the oil executive who wants to protect their sort of like built in um, uh, uh, benefits of, of the, the current sort of, of way of things who uses that as see this conversation is way more complicated it's not just my fault so i really don't need to change anything well i think we need to begin the conversation by saying we are on the same boat uh this is called a spaceship earth uh unless we can escape from the planet uh we're trapped and it doesn't matter whether you're the us or you're india this is a global problem right secondly uh we need to find ways uh probably by helping by providing funding to some of those countries um, from the rich countries that uh, will help them make the transition towards a more ecological economy, a greener economy. Uh, without that, it's going to be really difficult. Look, Greg, we are burning right now four times more coal than we were in the 1970s. We're actually going backwards. And that's because all of that coal now is being burned not in Europe or the United States that much, but in China, in India and other emerging markets. So we're actually going backwards. We're not uh, making any progress. Uh, so un until we actually have a um, honest conversation with all of those countries in the world and uh, we understand their uh, aspirations and they understand our aspirations and our way of uh, looking at things, um, we're not going to find a solution to this uh, very, very pressing, urgent problem of the climate emergency. So as we wrap up here, what is, uh, I have two questions. One is, what is the one thing that you hope readers walk away with? And two, what is the one reason? And these could be the same answer, but what is the one reason why they should go and pick up a copy? Well, I hope that people understand that uh, the way in which we have organized our lives for the last hundred years or so is not the best, that that uh, old way of organizing our lives makes it very difficult for women to realize their full potential and makes it very difficult for some of those other groups that I mentioned earlier, like high school dropouts or teenage mothers, to also have a fulfilling life. Um, that's, I think, the, the, the main message and that uh, there's uh, an opportunity now, thanks to technology, thanks to longer life expectancy, uh, to make changes. And then, uh, you know, the reason I would urge them to go and uh, get the book and read it is that uh, I think it's really important to get ready for the larger scale changes that are going to be taking place over the next few years. In the book, I discuss how individuals should be adapting or adjusting uh, to this new reality. So I think... Uh, you know, that, that would be the, the answer to those questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. The book is called The Perennials, The Megatrends Creating a Post-Generational Society. It is out everywhere today, actually, uh, but it, the links to get it pretty much anywhere are, are in the description of this episode. Any final thoughts before we jump off here? Well, I think uh, I want to emphasize the message that everything around us is changing. And once again, the only possible response to change is change. So we need to uh, adopt that mindset that we need to change. The book is called The Perennials, The Megatrends Creating a Post-Generational Society. It is out today wherever you get your books. And of course, links to that are in the description of this episode. I want to thank our guest today, Mauro Guillen. It was a fantastic conversation. I had a ton of fun and I can't thank you enough for appearing on the show. Highly recommend you check out the book. It's one of those things that doesn't necessarily feel like it affects you on a day-to-day -day basis, but it does affect the list of opportunities that you have going forward, as well as the opportunities that your kids might have if you choose to have kids or if you currently have kids. With that said, I want to remind you that I am hiring. I'm looking for a video editor. This is a part-time position. You'll be working on this podcast as well as a number of other pieces of content that I'm currently producing and there will be training involved. All you really need is some basic Premiere Pro experience and a willingness to learn and go through the process. Uh, head over to tlbc.co slash apply if that sounds interesting to you because I'd love to connect. And with that said, thank you for being here. My name is Greg Clunas and remember that all big changes come from the tiny leaps you take every day.